Well, good afternoon, folks. My name is Jeff Gramlich, and uh, welcome to the Spring Hoops Tax Forum. Uh, first, let's have a, a, just a note about logistics. Um, we're going to have a question and answer session at the, at the end after, after our speaker, David, um, completes his comments. And you can text your questions to 207-518-8066. This is the number that is in red on your program. Um, if you're receiving extra credit today, uh, there's a scan machine located on the table across the hall. You can scan your, your ID on the way out after the conclusion of, of the event. Um, in keeping with WSU's land-grant mission and the founding principles of the Hoops Tax Institute, it is my pl privilege and responsibility to provide educational opportunities to our students and to the public, including through forums like this. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. David Schumacher, our keynote speaker. David is the director of the Washington State Office of Financial Management. He reports directly to Governor Jay Inslee. Here's a bit of background about David. He has nearly 25 years of experience in budgeting and policy development. He began his career in state service in 1990 as an economic analyst for the State Department of Revenue. After three years, he then worked as a revenue analyst in the Office of Financial Management for a couple of years. Then he became budget analyst for the Senate Ways and Means Committee for eight years before being named its staff director. David joined Governor Inslee's administration in January 2013 as the director of the Office of Financial Management, and he will be speaking this afternoon on Governor Inslee's 2017-19 financial plan. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving David Schumacher a warm Cougar welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, am, I do not believe I've ever been able to bestow extra credit on anybody before. <laughs> so you guys all owe me one. So please don't mention that none of you were born in 1990 when I started doing this, because that will make me feel very bad and very old. Um, I'm the governor's budget director. I run the Office of Financial Management, which includes the uh, budget shop, it, it's the accounting for the state, it's human resources. Um, but what I'm here to talk about mostly is the governor's budget, the context of the state budget, like where are we now, how does the state budget work, where are we in the legislative process, and then because this is primarily a tax group, as I understand, the presentation is weighted a little more heavily towards taxes and revenue questions than than I might typically um, talk about. So please ask questions as we go. I'm perfectly happy, or you could save them to the end, and we'll do them at the end. Either way is fine. Um, so a little bit of context, how, how the budget works. The governor's budget, in odd-numbered years, like now, the legislature comes to town in January, and we write the state biennial budget. So you write it to your budget. So before the legislature came to town in December, the governor kind of kicks off the process by rolling out his budget. So right before Christmas, every year, the governor will put out his budget and we'll talk about his ads, his cuts, his revenues, and how it all balances both operating, capital budget, buildings and things, and transportation budget. So that's the kind of the beginning of the session. The second Monday of every January, the legislature comes to town in a even numbered years for 105 days for the regular session. So the beginning of January, since they have only just started, is kind of a time for the governor. We present our budget, we go in front of the committees, they say, if they like it, they say nice things. The other side says mean things, and it's all part of the first few weeks of session. Then the legislature gets into the, the regular book of business, they start passing bills, they start working on their own budget, and typically the third and fourth weeks of March, the House and Senate will come out with their budgets. So at that point, 
they will both have looked at the governor's budget and decided what they liked, what they didn't like. And we will have a House and a Senate budget that will come out. And then at some point, they will get together and start negotiating. And the governor will call the budget directors or the budget leaders in and the leadership in and make sure that they know what the governor's interest is in the budget. Because the budget, like any other bill, needs both houses to pass, but it needs the governor to sign it. And the governor and the the uh, reason they care about the governor signing it is because the governor not only can sign things, but the governor can veto things. And you don't have to veto the whole budget. That would be pretty drastic. Um, but you can certainly veto things out of the budget. So we try to make sure that both sides know the things that we really don't like so that if the legislature wants to avoid vetoes, they can work with us and, and come to some kind of compromise. We have typically 105 days in a legislature where one party runs one side and one party runs the other side has not been enough. There's very often a special session where even though you work together to get a compromise, you don't quite get done and, and you go for maybe another 30 days. Unfortunately, the last two odd years, 15 and 13, have been a little worse than normal and that we've gone all the way toward the end of June, which, besides being annoying to anybody who works there, um, puts a shutdown of state government at risk. The state cannot run after July 1st without appropriations, without the legislature giving us authority to spend money. So that's kind of been this specter. It's kind of this Washington, D.C. version come to roost in Olympia that we're hoping to avoid this year, but, but it's, it's kind of a concern altogether. So I will go through some slides, a little bit of budget and a little bit more about revenue, and we'll just get started. So fundamentally, revenues in this state grow a little bit slower than the economy, which over time becomes a problem. Um, Revenue, the, if the state economy grows by about 5%, revenues grow by 4%. And as this continues on year after year, the, the tax structure just simply doesn't keep up. On top of kind of this long-term problem, we have a short-term problem. We have this big obligation to fund public schools. So this is a chart that shows two things. So the stuff on the top is budget, stuff on the bottom is revenue. So when we build budgets, I guess everybody can see. So just, this is kind of the big dumb version of how I explain the budget. So we've got 30 plus billion dollars of spending. So this bar really goes like all the way back over here, right? What did we spend last biennium? 30 some billion. If we simply paid for everything that we bought before, we, absolutely nothing new. We just paid for everything that, that was there. You know, the K-12 system, there's more kids, you pay for them. You got X many teachers, you got X many colleges, you got higher ed, you got corrections, all of that. Then we have this thing called McCleary that folks who've been paying attention to Olympia will know about. This is the K-12 obligation the state has. And then here is anything new, right? Any, you know, in the governor's budget, we can talk about it. It's uh, mental health spending, but any new item that we didn't have before fits in here. So that all sounds great, except this is how much money we have right now. So somehow, we're either not going to do all of this, or we're going to make the revenue line higher. So the fundamental fight that will be in the legislature this year will be one side thinks we should do a few cuts, lots of ads, and new revenue. And the other side thinks we should, should do lots of cuts, very few ads, and absolutely no revenue. And then before we're done, we will have to find some combination of that that both sides and the governor can agree to. 
but as you can see, we got a pretty considerable. This is, you know, in big, this is, you know, a few hundred million, this is a couple billion. So this is like three or four billion dollars out of a $36 billion budget that as a starting point doesn't balance. So what do we do in our, in our budget? One thing I should talk about is McCleary. So the Supreme Court has said that the state of Washington is not doing its part in fully funding basic education, K-12. That because our Constitution is very strong when it comes to talking about K-12, it says it's the paramount duty of the state to pay for K-12. It doesn't say, some states say that you have to make ample provisions, and some say you just, um, I'm trying to remember what South Carolina says. There's a reason that South Carolina schools are so bad. The, the, uh, their constitution is very weak on what you have to do on behalf of K-12. But our state, is, it's very high. What has happened in the state over the last 20 or 30 years is that the, because the state has not kept up with its side of the bargain, local school districts have had to run local levies, not for extras, but for basics. And the, most of those basics are teacher salaries. So in a lot of districts in the state, local levy money goes to teacher salaries. And the Supreme Court says, that's not right. That's the state's obligation. That's not the local's obligation. So what we're talking about here in this session, beyond just balancing the regular budget that never balances, because and it's always a fight, we have this extra significant multi-billion dollar problem that needs to be sorted out. So first and foremost, the, in our budget was our solution to McCleary. So we significantly increased teacher salaries in our proposal, especially those at the low end, first, the first few years of teacher salaries. But we also had the rest of the budget, right? So the rest of the budget included a significant increase in the mental health investment. If this wasn't for McCleary and all the K-12 money we're spending, this would be the biggest mental health year that we've ever had. Our mental health proposal, it's, it's, I think, important to think of it in two ways. One, we have the large institutions, Western State Hospital and, and Eastern State Hospital, much smaller, but, but large institutions, as well as community mental health. And we've had significant problems in the Western State Hospital for the last few years, um, in large part because we haven't been able to pay the nurses enough to make them want to stay there and work. So there are safety concerns, there's quality of care concerns. So what we have done is invested money in nurses, as well as thinking about down the road where the future does not include necessarily these big institutions, but includes more small community-based places for people to go for their mental health needs. So we're trying to get them both in line, right? How do you, you you've got a problem, you know, you've got a problem today, and then you also have things that you have to think about in the future, so you're not spending money on things now that you wish you hadn't down the road. Then we go down further in something completely pandering to this crowd, um, freezing tuition again. Uh, I think most of you guys are probably aware that after the recession, tuition went up dramatically. Then in the last couple of years, it's actually been cut. And the proposal in the governor's budget is to freeze it for one more biennium, give the schools the equivalent of that tuition increase so the, the, the schools don't get cut by the tuition freeze, and then invest in financial aid. So the state need grant, this, this state state need grant currently doesn't have enough money to pay for everybody who's eligible under the state need grant. Um, the governor's budget cuts that a little more in half, but there still, I think, would be 10,000 students that would be eligible by the definition, and when they get to, to their time uh, you know, in line, the, the money will be out. So there's a question in higher ed about 
you know, is it tuition? Is it higher tuition for everybody and more financial aid? Is it lower tuition and less financial aid? You know, these things will be sorted out in the, in the budgets. So let's move. This is what I was talking about in terms of the governor's K-12 plan. So $2.7 billion for teacher compensation. Every district in the state gets more money. Most districts have, will have local taxes reduced because, as I mentioned before, uh, local property taxes are currently going to pay for teachers. If the state picks up its share, the locals won't have to do quite so much. So there's a local property tax cut. There's no increase in the state property tax, which is something that if we get into this, this later, um, others in Olympia have talked about raising the state property tax and cutting the local property tax. I'll, when we get to the revenue side, we'll talk about how we, and by we I mean my boss, chose differently about where the money would come from. So a little bit of context of revenue. For years, we would talk about revenue growing about 4.5%. So that's this green line. Now, it never really did ever grow 4.5% every year for 10 years. But it would grow by 3% for a while and 5% for a while. And, but in the long run, it would grow by 4.5%. Then we had the recession, the Great Recession. And as you see, it kind of went back to this old 4.5% growth path, but it never caught up. In previous recessions, we would have a, a bad year or two, and then we'd have a great year or two. So you would catch up. All the stuff that, that was a problem you know, two years ago, you would have enough revenue to, to fill those holes. So in large part, what what the job of a budget guy was, was to fill the hole for that 18 month to 24 month problem until the revenue came back and you could kind of get back to, to time as, as normal. Well, you, you see here, normal now is just less than it would have been otherwise. Now it's still growing, but we lost considerably. There were lots of cuts. That's when tuition went up, class sizes went up. Um, Human services were cut. You started having to pay to go to parks. I mean, those are all real things that happened. And we haven't really caught up, right? We're in this, this new lower level. So this gets back to the question of, of why isn't there enough money to do this stuff, right? Aren't I just whining about it and just balance the budget and shut up? which sometimes I hear in crowds like this. And which is why I came up with this chart. So this shows revenue as a share of the economy. So if you go back to the 80s, early 90s, we were about 6.5%, up maybe 7% of the state's economy went to taxes. Then, starting in the mid-90s, for several reasons, there were some significant tax cuts. But you can see that from the mid-90s till now, we have continually had a smaller and smaller share in terms of taxes, to the point where now we're down to like 4.5%. It's a 30% cut in revenue. So we're making do with a 30% smaller share of the economy in taxes than we had in the early 90s. Now, somebody will say, say, well, that's a good thing, which, I mean, it is. Everybody wishes taxes were lower. But 30% lower taxes means 30% lower services, right? So the things that have occurred in these last several years where we've cut services have been directly because of this. So our 82-year-old tax system. So there's a number of reasons why we haven't kept up. One, we cut taxes a lot in the mid-90s. The, the economy was booming, and the state had surpluses, had more money than it wanted to spend all, all at once, and it, made, it did some significant tax cuts. The problem is those tax cuts have now been in place for 20 years, 
And the surplus, you know, surpluses last a year and a half, right? We, we plowed through the savings account and we still have significant tax cuts. Secondly, if you compare 1974 to 2015, the service sector is twice as big as it used to be. And why is that significant? Because in this state, we tax, the sales tax is half of our taxes. And the sales tax is predominantly on goods. And as the goods part of the economy gets smaller and the service part of the economy gets bigger, we're continually losing. As a share of the economy, we're continually losing. Um, the other thing to talk about is internet sales, right? In the 80s and 90s, when I, st when I started doing this in 1990, the thing they talked about was, this will sound stupid, um, was seed catalogs and L.L. Bean catalogs. Right? That was the hole in the, the tax structure because people were just spending too much money on L.L. Bean catalogs and it was $13 million or something that was going untaxed. Well, the logic that kept us legally from not taxing that is the same logic that we can't tax the internet, which is now hundreds of millions of dollars. As anybody who maybe used to buy from, uh, I was going to say, gets half their stuff from Amazon, Amazon, because they're located in the state of Washington, has to collect the tax. But there's a number of other, and I'm sure everybody knows, providers who, since they do not have presence in this state, do not have to collect the sales tax. So that is a problem both for our tax structure in this state, as well as you know, the brick and mortar, you know, the malls, the local businesses who think they're losing, losing business. So that was a little bit about the sufficiency of taxes, right? We, our taxes have not kept up with the growth of the economy. This next part is about who pays those taxes. And we are the, this is one of the, the things that we do not like to brag about being number one. We are the most regressive state in the country. People, so this is kind of hard to see, but you kind of get the, the sense of it. Green is Washington. So for the top 1%, we have very low taxes in Washington. For the bottom 20%, we have the highest taxes in Washington. And you can see this, that for most states, if you can kind of get the sense of it, it's relatively flat. You know, California's taxes are a little higher and flat. Oregon and Idaho are a little lower. But it's relatively flat. Everybody pays about the same share of their taxes based on their income. But in Washington, the, this top group pays 2.4% of their taxes. And at the top end, or you know, at the bottom end, the lowest 20% pays about 16%. And even the, the next 20% pay somewhere in 12%. So 40% of the people in the state of Washington have among the, the highest taxes of any place in the country. So when we talk to people about our taxes, the other chart that showed that our taxes have gone down, we've gone from like 11th in the country to 35th in the country. But when you tell, when I do things like this, and I talk to people who are in this part, we are not a low tax state for people at the bottom end of the income spectrum. We're a very high tax state. And it's because of this, this, the slope of this regressive tax structure. This maybe points it out a little more directly. I did this job for years and years before I saw quite how ridiculous our tax structure was. Again, you can see that the others, you know, they may be a little different, but you know, Oregon and Idaho are fundamentally different politically. But their top 1%. 6.4, 6.5, California, 8%, a little higher tax, Washington, 2.4%. Right? We are, we are a fundamental outlier compared to, to all the other states. So as we thought about balancing the budget, it also mattered. We didn't want to make this problem 
at least we didn't want to make this problem worse. So here's that next one that you can see. Here's average taxes, and here's Washington. We're ranked 35th. So states, I mean, you can have 35th in the country colleges and K-12 and corrections, or you can have first, or you can have 15th, right? You can decide as a state where you want to balance. But what's happened in this state is I think we still have this expectation of being a relatively wealthy state that, it can, that can afford to be 10th or 11th or 12th in terms of the level of services. But we've slipped all the way down to 35th in terms of how much money we actually have. And that disconnect is a, is a big problem that we have, right? Because here I'm telling people that we, you live in a low-tax state. And that chart we looked at before said that for almost half of the people, they live in a high-tax state. So how do, you, how do you fix this problem and get people to believe what you're talking about? So the governor has to balance all of these various things when he's coming up with the budget, right? Not only is the budget about what you buy, but it's how you pay for it. And once he decided that his budget was going to take some new revenue, it mattered not just how much, but it mattered what, what was the flavor, if you will, right? What sources of the revenue? So we did a few things. We raised the B&O tax on services from 1.5% to 2.5%, the business tax. This gets back to this idea that services are a larger and larger part of the economy. And because sales tax is not collected, it's a relatively undertaxed part of the economy. We doubled the filing threshold to 100,000. So, so at the time that we're raising the overall tax, we're also raising the threshold for small businesses. So the smallest of businesses don't feel the, the pain of the tax increase. So this will generate about $2.3 billion of our plan. Next, we propose the capital gains tax. In this state, um, it's been a long time since anybody really proposed an, in an income tax. Income taxes are wildly unpopular in this state and probably will continue to be wildly unpopular. So the question was, well then, if we're not going to go that direction, what can we do to tax the wealthiest? You know, that, that regressive tax structure chart showed that the people at the very top end are paying, they're getting a really good deal here, we'll put it that way. So we proposed a 7.9% capital gains tax. This is only for people, like for families that have $50,000 or more a year of capital gains, not $50,000 more of income, but of, of capital gains. So this affects only a tiny fraction of the taxpayers. I think it's in maybe 30 or 40,000 people in the state. It does not apply to people's retirement accounts, to their homes, to their farms. This would generate about $800 million, this biennium, and about almost $2 billion thereafter. The capital gains, since it takes a while to get this up and running, it would, it would start in the middle of this biennium. And so that number's kind of half as big as the ongoing number. So here's capital gains tax. As you will see, obviously, in the middle of the, the run-up to the recession and the recession, there's some volatility here, but in the long run, we think that the volatility can be managed with the state savings account and the value of the capital gains tax in terms of having the wealthiest people in the state pay for some share of this counteracts that. Then we have a carbon tax. The carbon tax, similar to the capital gains tax, would take about a year to get up and running um, so it generates about $2 billion per year, so that would be $4 billion. 
in the next biennium. Carbon tax would be used in two ways. One, just to help the operating budget, right? To help our K-12 situation. The other is on the capital side. Um, the capital budget is where we pay for K-12 school construction. We pay for, I'm sure this building was purchased with st state bond dollars. Um, prisons, things like that, major buildings, DSHS buildings are paid for out of the capital budget. What has happened over the last 20 years is that we used to cut down a lot more trees in the state of Washington. And the taxes that we would get off of that would go to fund schools. That's the way it was set up originally. Now that we, we don't do that, we still have people, we still have kids moving here, going to school, and there's no underlying revenue source for them. So the capital budget is just where we borrow money to build buildings. And there's a set amount of money every year that we can spend. And K-12 construction is becoming a bigger and bigger piece of that. As the timber money goes away and as there's more kids and as class sizes are smaller, right, you can either think of smaller class sizes or, you know, if you have smaller class sizes, you have to have more classrooms, right? You need more teachers and you need more, more classes. So that cost is going up. So what does that put pressure on? Well, that puts pressure on everything that used to be in that 70% of the budget that w went for everything else is now shoved into the 50% of the budget. For example, higher ed used to get 50% of the capital budget. I think that now they are probably going to be around 30% of the budget and on a path to probably be worse than that if we don't do something about it. So you have this constrained amount of money and K-12 is, um, K-12 capital is not the paramount duty, but but in Olympia, K-12 construction is the first thing in the capital budget that everybody pays for, right? People vote in their local districts. When they vote for the money, the state matches it and they build the school buildings. So there's a tremendous amount of pressure that's going to be applied to the capital budget for years to come, if not decades to come. So we took half the carbon money for the operating budget. We took half for the capital budget. And the money in the capital budget pays for things that are kind of the extras. So as we start pushing out all the extras out of the capital budget, there are still needs for clean energy projects. Governor Inslee is a big proponent of clean energy projects. Water infrastructure, forest health. And then we use some of the money to reinvest so that lower income people would not feel the brunt of this. So some people may ask, well, we just had a carbon tax on the ballot and it went down. Why are you guys proposing another one? One, I think, given we're in a situation where new revenue is needed to make the, the budget balance, it's, it's like given that, where would, you, where would you go? One of the things about the, the tax, the carbon tax that was on the ballot, it actually cut taxes. So Governor Inslee, who's about as green as any governor in the country, actually did not support that initiative because it cut revenue at a time that we're trying to, to solve McCleary. So the part of him that would like a carbon tax for environmental reasons didn't want a carbon tax that cut revenue because he knew that that was just going to make our McCleary problem that much worse. In addition, there's, this, there's a significant need that's been pointed out in Olympia in these last several years around water infrastructure. And in Olympia, people call it the big water. There's kind of an agreement between Eastern Washington agriculture, Western Washington uh, flood prone areas, if you will, and Puget Sound environmental, Puget Sound cleanup. And that these three groups have kind of worked together and have an idea of how they would spend billions of dollars over the next 20 years. And they've got it all figured out except, of course, the hard part, which is where do the billions of dollars come from, right? They've got all the spending figured out. They have no money. And what the governor said was, we could, we could fund these kind of programs with the carbon tax. 
so the carbon tax can both fund his clean energy interests, but also these water infrastructure that are, are needs all over the state. And in this way, that, that legislators who might be a little bit skeptical of carbon taxes or climate change or whatever, but are not skeptical when it comes to the flood damage that occurs in Chehalis. Chehalis has a 100-year flood every three years anymore. Um, whether it's irrigation problems in eastern Washington, whether it's you know, environmental cleanup in Puget Sound, that members, legislative members, are interested in some solution to this. So we put this proposal together to try to get some broad support where everybody could see both a solution to McCleary and a solution to some of these capital budget problems because there's simply no way that these things are gonna get funded within the capital budget on an ongoing basis. There's just no room left anymore. And then of course, the inevitable closing loophole. So, you know, right now there's no sales tax on bottled water. There was for years. I don't think it ever kept anybody from buying bottled water. Um, but, but that would generate $57 million. Uh, refund the sales tax to non-residents. Here, you know, and this is sometimes problematic in border cities. You know, Pullman, Spokane, Walla Walla, Vancouver. Um, but, you know, folks in Oregon don't have to pay sales tax when they come and buy things here. So that's a hit to the state's revenues. But for businesses who are on the border, they are perfectly happy having Oregon people come in and selling them things. Um, then we have a, a few others, trade-ins on cars. Um, but, but as you see, these kinds of are odds and ends, right? 50 million here, 40 million here. It's real money. But when you're trying to raise billions of dollars for K-12, you know, you would need 100 of these to get there instead of a modest list. And what, what we find in Olympia, the politics of it, is every one of these is difficult to close, right? So for everybody who thinks that it's a loophole, there's somebody that will say that it's economic development, right? If there's an industry that this helps in their district, it, it could be jobs in their district, right? So it's very difficult, even for people who think that closing loopholes probably makes some sense, when you get to them item by item, it, it gets pretty difficult. We've been able to close a few over the last few years but not as nearly as many as you would think given the rhetoric of people saying, yeah, you should close loopholes. It sounds, it sounds much easier than it is. Oh. I thought I had one more. That's an abrupt ending to my. <laughs> All right. Well, so. We have some time for, for questions and answers. Thank you, Mr. Sean. Hello, is that better? Okay, much better. All right, first question is, why did Governor Inslee and Oregon's current governor state they won't fix the I-5 bridge connecting Vancouver and Portland? Well, the governor and the former Oregon governor tried very hard to do that. The legislature stopped. Um, For them, I don't know. <laughs> The legislature stopped that. There's a lot of um, political pushback in Vancouver against that, um, which, you know, to be honest, was a shame. There was a significant amount of federal money that came attached with that project. And now I think that window is closed. So that if there is an attempt to do it again, I think we, we would have to redesign it and figure out how to pay for it without the federal government helping out. So the, there was a, a chance for a couple years there that we would get significant support. A lot of these major projects have federal money attached to them. And in Olympia, the legislature turned it down. I think in large part because in Vancouver, I th in Vancouver, Washington, it's considered somewhat a, of a local issue 
Whereas I think for the rest of us, I mean, I-5, it's a fundamental corridor for, for business for the entire region. So I think it was, it was rather short-sighted. Second question is, didn't Governor Inslee run on a platform that claimed he wouldn't raise taxes? If so, why has it changed? If not, do you have any idea why I got this impression? I think that he probably, well, one, I know for a fact that the decision to fully fund McCleary and to, to propose this level of revenue was made after the, after the election. So we spent the summer going through things. We went through the summer looking at, at cuts to figure out what would a budget look like that, that only did loopholes. He's always talked about loopholes and maybe some revenue. But the question was, okay, what would it look like with a little bit of revenue and a little bit of cleverness and cuts? And we went through and cut our way through the budget and pulled that together and showed it to him. And it was just too drastic, right? The revenue, the forecasts, the economy didn't pick up fast enough to, to grow our way out of the problem. He didn't want to face the Supreme Court by ignoring this McCleary problem. And he decided that for the good of the state, we had to, we had to find new revenue. Next question is, how much is the state expecting to make in tax revenue from marijuana sales? Would a shutdown of the industry by the federal government impact Washington revenue from sales? It would. Um, <coughs> I think this biennium revenue from marijuana is in the few hundred million dollar range. And next biennium, it would be somewhere like over half a billion. So that that would be noticed. I mean, that's real money. Um, you know, in a $40 billion budget, you know, it, it wouldn't put us in a complete tailspin. To be honest, I'm more concerned with uh, changes to the Medicaid system in our state than I am to the medical marijuana. Not that they're connected logically, but, you know, they're both things that could come from Washington, D.C. And, and put a significant budget impact on us. Medicaid is the, the, the program in the state that is basically half state and half federal where we take care of health care for low-income people. And if, if, the, uh, if the federal government pulls back on that, that would be either have a significant I impact on the health of people in this state or if, if we were able to manage to keep paying for it, it would be, it'd be very expensive. Right now, we're paying for half of it if we had to pay for 100% of it, that, that would be billions of dollars. What are you doing in the form of tax policy to encourage the growth of entrepreneurship and small business across the state of Washington? So it's hard to talk about that at a time when you're raising taxes on everybody, right? Um, so in the, back, in the back of our mind, or maybe not in the back of the mind, on, as we're talking about this, we're trying to make sure that it's not worse for small business. So when we raised the B&O tax on services, we made sure that small businesses were not impacted by that. Um, another thing that we're working on, you know, if, if you've been to Seattle lately, you'll realize that every crane on the West Coast is within three blocks of each other getting, getting in the way, and that that economic growth is not really happening everywhere else, right? So we have this ridiculous amount of growth you know, in downtown Seattle or in South Lake Union, and it's not spread very well around the state. So there's been a lot of discussions, there's been a lot of bipartisan discussions this year about rural economic development, whether that's um, getting businesses to locate in cities that aren't called Seattle, whether that's trying to get broadband into some parts of the state, whether that's um, potential tax breaks for industries so that they don't, we don't lose them in rural Washington. So there's a number of ideas like that that, that I know are, are going around. In fact, I believe, look at my calendar, I think, I think that I am actually missing, either the, I either missed or I'm missing tomorrow a, a breakfast the governor is having with a number of members from all over the state on, this, on rural economic development where 
he's going to listen to people's ideas about what, what will help them. Um, and a lot of these things are specific. You know, uh, there's something different that would help, you know, Grays Harbor than would help Moses Lake, you know, that would help um, in Eastern Washington agriculture versus, you know, small businesses in Bellingham or something, right? So that everybody kind of comes to it from their own corner of the state. But these are things that I think that there might be a package that could be pulled together that people might want to vote for. A lot of people with disabilities receive community-based home care versus in-hospital care. How will you address the rising cost of community-based care if additional funding is only added to hospital care? Or is there additional funding, funding plan for community-based home care? Um, there is. I, I assume this is a mental health question from, from my comments. So there, there is additional money for a number of things in mental health. So starting from the institutions, the public hospitals, we also proposed increasing how much money private hospitals get for taking care of these folks. We've put money in to try to keep people from having to enter the institutions in the first place. Diversion programs, um, one of the things that happens in our state when you don't have enough place to give people treatment is they end up in our county jails. Right? The, if you talk to anybody who runs a county jail, they're running the largest mental hospital in the state combined. Right? And they're not getting the, the kind of service that somebody needs. Right? These people don't belong in jail. They, belong getting treatment. In addition, there is money for, in the community level. And the governor actually proposed building smaller public hospitals across the state. So we proposed building nine of these across the state, but smaller, 16 beds instead of the hundreds of beds. Um, when we took a look, we spent the summer looking at our mental health system. And we had consultants come in and over and over, what we have learned is that the, the direction that other states are going and that is working better for the individuals in the hospitals is to, is to get them through quicker, so turn 90-day stays into 60-day stays so they can get out quicker. You can get more people in quicker, right? People don't end up in jails waiting to get in. But to do this, to speed it up, you also need a place for people to go when they come out. And this is where the community-based um, placements occur, whether it's public placements, meaning the state owns the building, or it's nonprofits that take care of people. So it's no, our plan is not any one of these, it's, it's all of these. It's the continuum from the very beginning to, to make sure that people that don't need to be institutionalized never go into the institution, to the other end to make sure that people, once they get better, have a place to land and reintegrate into the community. Washington gets a lot of money from the federal government for Medicaid. If the ACA or Obamacare is repealed and Medicaid uh, support plummets and more people are uninsured, how will, how will this be dealt with in your office? That is a good question. I don't know. I mean, I, I kind of talked about that before. I mean, this is hundreds of millions of dollars and tens of thousands of people that we will have to figure out how to pay for and how to cover. And one of the problems is the, there is no single plan from Washington, D.C. about what they're going to do. So everybody, you know, it, it's kind of the rumor of the day. You know, well, what if they do this, or what if they do this, or what if they do this? And if they do it, will it hit all at once, or will it be a long-term thing? Um, we were talking before, often what happens is that Congress will pass um, block grants. So they'll say, for some program, say there's a $100 million program that they don't really want to pay for much anymore. Instead of saying, your $100 million program, we're only going to give you $50 million from now on. They may say, we're going to give you $100 million a year for forever. It's not going to grow. And then the, the growth in the population and the growth of the, in the, the cost of the program 
kind of squeezes you itself. But they can say, we, you know, their logic is, well, we didn't cut it. You guys can spend it. So at one extreme, it could be kind of a gradual squeezing as the federal government pays a smaller and smaller share of what's in the budget. On the other hand, if they just pull the plug, we've got 20s of thousands of people that would be out of health care you know, in a heartbeat. And that's a pretty scary thought. Judging by the current House and Senate, by how much do you predict this, predict, this budget will change before it is passed? I expect them to, to pass my budget without changing a comma. <laughs> I will be wrong again. Um, you know, the governor's budget, I mean, w when you put together a governor's budget, part of it is showing how everything works. Part of it is showing the governor's priorities. And part of it is kind of setting a high bar to hold people accountable. So in our plan, we set a high bar for McCleary. Not only did we fund the compensation part of it, but we funded um, wraparound services in the schools. The governor's a big proponent of kind of the back office social service part um, that makes some schools very effective in solving their dropout problems and that we wanted to extend that statewide. We, the governor also is a proponent of mentoring in the schools. You get these, you know, smart 24 year olds that have their education degree and they're all eager to be a teacher and they walk in to a group of insane nine year olds and can't, and can't control the classroom. And we lose a, a number of teachers for that reason and that he's a big proponent of having teachers within the school help the new teachers. You know, every year there's a few new teachers in every classroom, and helping the, those new teachers learn how to, to control and how to run a classroom and, and be effective and, you know, handle the disciplinary problems and handle the, you know, the boys are crazy and the girls are polite or... I've got a seven-year-old, so I, I have a pretty good understanding. I went to... Not that anybody asked, but I went to a birthday party of my son's seven-year-old friend who's, who's a, a girl. So there's, you know, 18 people at the party and, you know, nine polite, lovely girls wearing dresses and nine insane little boys, mine being one of them, going crazy, yelling and screaming, right? And there's nothing that makes a nine or a, a seven-year-old boy go crazy than a whole room full of seven-year-old boys. <laughs> Those dynamics, when you're trying to teach them something, we're just trying to give them cupcakes, right? Those dynamics are very difficult for, for young teachers. The governor's father was a teacher. He talks about this a lot. His father was a teacher, and his father told him that he wouldn't have made it past the first year if it wasn't for this old teacher that, had, that helped him out, and that that really stuck with the governor, and when he's gone around and talked to principals and superintendents and teachers, that they all reinforced that that would be a, a, a big help. That's a long-winded answer to the, the governor set a high bar about this is what it would look like if we really did right by K-12, and we're trying to encourage the legislature to meet that high bar. They won't. You know, it's difficult. It's a lot of money. It's a, lot, it's a lot to ask of this much revenue to support that. But part of this is, is kind of, you know, getting people to set their sights a little bit higher. You know, what the legislature will do, the legislature's got two very slim majorities. The, the Senate is 25 to 24 Republican. The House is 50 to 48 Democrat, right? They're just, just about dead even. Um, they have been pretty close for a while. And the people in the middle often are the ones, you know, that will decide this. So the people in the middle on the Republican side probably want to spend more education money. And the people in the middle on the Democrat side are probably pretty leery about raising as much in taxes as the, as the governor proposed. So how, how do you find majorities in both places that everybody is comfortable with? You know, that's, that's what we'll spend the next several months working on.
Great. One last question. What is the governor doing to, uh, about increasing taxes on the top 15% and lowering taxes for the bottom 40%, or at least equalize it? Right. Well, I mean, we certainly, the, the, the capital gains tax certainly raises taxes on the upper part. The governor also proposed the cut in the property taxes, which doesn't just help the people at the bottom, but helps people across the, across the board. Um, I think that it's, it's difficult at a time when you're trying to raise taxes to significantly also reform taxes. But he certainly, in the middle of this tax package, was concerned about the impact on small businesses and the impact on people at the, at the lower ends of the, the income bracket. David, thank you so much for, for making the trek all the way to this side of the state. Thank you. Your, your questions have been great. I'm very impressed by the quality of the questions that, that you've sent in. Um, and we do have one uh, small token, and there, there is a state limit as to how much we can make the token. Uh, but there is a, a, a coffee a travel mug in there and a pen, I believe, with uh, WSU Cougar uh, emblazoned on there. David, thank you very much. Thank you.